It's safe to say that the police, EMTs, and all emergency staff don't have an easy job. Be warned, some of the stories in today's video are particularly graphic and are not for the faint of heart. They will be marked in the timestamps in the description with an X if you would like to skip over them. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I was an MP in the army many years ago, and I believe it was 2005 when this happened. Shortly after our shift started, we were called to secure a crime scene in one of the on-post housing areas for lower enlisted folks. When we arrived on the scene, we were given a very vague overview of what occurred by the first responders and CID investigators present. A 19-year-old infantryman, fresh off deploy, brutally stabbed his young wife to death. I think she was 18 years old. Too damn young either way. We were obviously given very little information, because the investigation had just started. But while securing the scene from the exterior, we were able to see the aftermath of everything that had happened through the windows and open doors. And what we were able to see was straight out of a horror film. The back door of the house was left open and one of the first things you noticed on approach was a bunch of tiny, bloody paw prints on the back porch. Looking further into the house, you could see dark stains on the carpet that looked like a body had been dragged across the floor, again, with tiny, bloody paw prints scattering the scene. Turns out, they had a tiny dog that ended up roaming through the aftermath, scattering the tracks around. Going to the front of the house and looking through the kitchen window is where we see the real bad stuff. The body had already been removed by the time we were able to get this view, but you could tell where she had finally died. There was a giant pool of blood on the floor, with what I can only call a halo of kitchen knives in a circle around where her head was. Blood was absolutely everywhere. On the fridge was a note scrawled in blood that read, Satan said she deserved it. I absolutely shit you not. Several days of securing that scene later, they finally closed it down and boarded up the home. The body was being held at the post morgue, and we ended up needing to put a guard in the morgue to secure the body, until the formal autopsy could be completed. I was the lucky son of a bitch that pulled body duty when the autopsy occurred. I was asked to sit in on the procedure, and it was easily the most horrifically graphic thing I have ever, and hopefully will ever witness. The poor girl was destroyed. Her husband stabbed her something like 50 to 60 times. The first thing you notice was the meat cleaver stuck in her neck. They just left it there. Just above the cleaver, her lower jaw was basically gone. I couldn't tell you how it was removed, 
but her tongue was just resting on her neck. The second thing you noticed was the absolutely perfect pentagram that was carved into her chest. I'll never forget how perfect that circle was and how the angles of the star looked like they were all made with a protractor. This sicko took his time to do this to her. The third thing I noticed was her hand. It looked like as if she had her hand put up in front of her face to block a strike and caught the cleaver across the palm. Three of her four fingers were dangling from a flap of skin barely still hanging on. This all seemed too much, but it got worse. As the medical personnel continued to catalogue the damage, they noticed what I think was the absolute worst of it all. They ended up pulling out a 14 inch long knife sharpener out of her vagina. The hilt of which wasn't even visible from the exterior of her body. He had inserted this into her and then they believed he had literally kicked it into her. They believe that she had already been dead by the point of this happening. I don't know how, but that was somehow almost relieving to hear at that point. The week or so securing that scene was creepy for sure, but the several hours of time spent in that autopsy made me question humanity and really changed my perspective on life as a whole. Two combat tours in Iraq, and this was probably the worst thing I had experienced during my time. When I was 12, I moved to my grandparents' campground in Dayton, Tennessee. One half of the campground was dedicated to RV and tent campers, the other half was a trailer park for more permanent residents. My grandmother worked seven days a week at the mum and pop shop. She sold bait, tackle gear, sandwiches, soda, candy, camping supplies and beer. We were the only dock on Lake Chicamangua with a gas pump. So we were always busy during the summer months. It was my job to run up and down the dock and pump boaters gas for them. It was a fun job. I got to see a lot of pretty girls in bikinis. In the trailer park area of the campground, there was an old couple living in a mobile home. They had a pontoon boat, berthed at our dock and a nice car. They were model tenants, and they always paid their rent on time, sometimes even early. But then one day, we noticed that their pontoon boat was gone. But we didn't really say much about it. Then we noticed that their car was gone as well. Then, rent day came and went. A week went by. Graham became concerned. So she walked to the trailer and knocked on the door. There was no response, but there was a note taped to the door. Nurses, come in. The older wife had to use a walker, but had recently took a turn for the worse with her health. Nurses would come and visit and take care of her every other day. Graham tried to open the door, but it was locked. She pounded on the door and called out their names, but received no reply. It was at this point that Graham became heavily concerned. 
So she called the sheriff, Leon Sneed, and he showed up about 10 minutes later. Graham gave him permission to force the door open, and the sheriff kicked in the door, and immediately put his hand over his nose and mouth and said to not go in there. There wasn't before long that more police and then an ambulance arrived. By this point, naturally, a crowd had started to gather. We all knew each other. Some were campers just passing through, but the crowd kept growing and growing. Eventually, two body bags were brought out of the trailer and put in the ambulance. Sheriff Sneed showed us photographs and explained to us what happened. Evidently, this old couple were behind on financial obligations. They repossessed their pontoon boat, their car, and they denied the wife's insurance. They had no family, no children, just themselves. It was murder and suicide. The man had left a suicide note and this is what it said. This is what happens to old people today when you run out of money. He had his wife put on her favourite dress. Then he strangled her to death and put her body on the kitchen table. Then he proceeded to drag a chair to the hallway and hammered a leather belt into the top of the hallway. He tightened it around his neck then he kicked the chair out from underneath him. When Sheriff Sneed found him, he was hanging lifelessly. But there were deep fingernail claw marks around his neck, where he most likely tried to free himself, but to no avail. The most chilling part of the story, other than the murder-suicide itself, was the fact that the trailer had only been 15 feet away from my school bus stop. It was estimated that they had been dead for at least a week. So that means for five days straight, I was standing 50 feet away from two dead bodies and I never knew. I am not a police officer, but I worked with the state police, running toes for them. And this 2012 Christmas still gives me nightmares. We received an emergency call to a crash that was blocking traffic both ways. We ran over there with a flatbed, assuming the worst. But when we got there, we were met with a rather awful scene. Usually people are banged up and we wait for them to be pulled out and then tow the car. So this was a first for me. The pickup truck was indeed blocking traffic. It had been T-boned, pulling out of a Walmart parking lot. The truck was turned around the centre of the road, cops and medics just standing around. We approached the scene. The horn is still blaring on the truck. There is a man hunched over, and his brain is splattered all over the interior of the truck. His head is mangled, and now parts of the steering wheel, hence the blaring horn. The gate of the truck had come down, throwing Christmas presents perfectly wrapped, with bows and cards all over the road. Between brains and Christmas gifts, I quit that night. I was interning with the sheriff's police department, so most of my time was spent on patrol. We got called out to do a wellness check with the deputy, and he thought it was going to be a piece of cake, like she was out of town or something. We get there, and are met by the neighbours who told us that the mail is piling up in the mailbox and that there are several untouched packages on the porch. 
So we get up the house. And the front door is unsecured. So we crack open the door a couple of inches. And the deputy calls inside. But the door won't move anymore. The house was one of those split houses. Where the stairs meet at the front door. And the upstairs and downstairs are offset. So we concluded that there might be stuff behind the door. It's about this time that the deputy tells me that she is a known hoarder. And that could be why the door was stuck. He also mentions that if we see flies on the insides of the window, she is most likely inside and deceased. As we walk around the side of the house, we notice a lot of flies on the windows. The back door was locked. And as we looked in, we noticed bags on bags of garbage, diapers, and miscellaneous shit all over the place. We head back to the front and attempt to make entry. He pushes the door open, this time with more force. And from underneath, I see a grease-like liquid spreading out from underneath the door. The deputy stops, closes the door, and calmly tells me that the lady was indeed dead and wedged behind the door. From the date of the packages, we concluded that she had been dead about two months. Once we did make entry into the house, I was allowed inside. After two months, she didn't even look like a human corpse. Her skin and body had sagged and melted into the floor and her face. Her face was all black and had been eaten to the bone by maggots. I'll never forget the smell when the coroner moved her and she popped. It was like a physical presence. Whatever those people get paid to deal with that shit, it's not enough. The thing that really got me though, was wondering if she had fallen down the stairs and died there, or if she fell, and was unable to move, and waited for help that would never come. I was speaking to one of the guys who was with me that day, and he told me a story about something that had happened to him. He used to work for a disaster and restoration company, cleaning up after fires or water damage. For whatever reason, he once got a job to clean up a dead body. It was the only time the company got a job like that, and the body itself had been removed, but the smell and chunks of flesh were remaining, and it was horrific. He told me it was the absolute worst thing he had ever smelt. No one in the whole company had the guts to do it. So it ended up being landed with him. He had to scrub up the chunky human sauce and remove the couch where the body had been found two weeks earlier. Even the floorboards had to be removed because the blood was so entrenched. You could smell the stink from a block away. It was also his job to concoct an anti-stink chemical mix to try and get rid of the smell. He pumped about a gallon of several industrial strength chemicals to rid of it completely over the next few days. Even then, I'm still not sure what the smell was. Even then, He's still not sure if the smell was completely gone from the house. Though, he says it may just be the fact that from working the job, the smell was just stuck in his nostrils. This is a case which I had to deal with personally. There were two adults that were reported missing. The parents of two adult children. One male, one female. Alerts are in place for the missing people's credit cards. The father's credit card 
hits on a purchase at a jewellery store, where an engagement ring was purchased. This quickly leads us to the son who made the purchase of the ring. We get the son in for questioning, and it didn't take him long to crack, and he confessed to killing both parents and burying them in shallow graves. The son led us to the gravesite, and we began the process of recovery. Both mother and father had a black garbage bag over their head, being held in place by duct tape around their necks. The sight of the bodies, especially their faces, once the bags were removed, and the smell, was something I'll never forget. His parents were drunks and lived an alternate lifestyle. On the night he killed them, he said his dad tore into him pretty good, calling him a loser, and a loser that was a mistake. He should never have been born. But he said what threw him over the edge was his dad calling him half a man. He flew into a rage and choked him out. The mother watched and did nothing. She realised that dad was dead and said something to the effect that she was right about him and the son gave it to her too. The girlfriend helped clean up the bodies and disposed of them. It didn't take the girlfriend long to flip and testify. I was called out to negotiate with a 17 year old female who had barricaded herself in a bathroom with multiple knives and scissors. She'd done it very well too, as SWAT ended up going through the sheetrock wall. She wouldn't talk with me at all, but had multiple graphic conversations with her mother, who committed suicide three years earlier, and her dad, who serving lots of years in prison for sexually abusing her. When SWAT pulled her out, she had completed multiple circumcisions on herself with the scissors, completely cut her own nipples off, and had sodomized herself multiple times with multiple steak knives. The kicker was, she was talking the whole time, and her tone or volume never changed. The pain never bothered her, or, more likely, she never felt it. The human mind is a scary thing. One cold October night, we got a call to assist the sheriff's office on a burglary in progress out in the country. Because our radios couldn't talk to the country roads, the country dispatch telephoned our dispatch, and our dispatch radio relayed the information to us. We basically had no info, and didn't know where we were going, and I had a lonely, eerie, creepy feeling in my bones, whilst driving at crazy speeds to help this family. It took us probably 25 minutes to arrive on the scene. This house was dark. It turned out the suspect had cut the power days before and had been living in the house while the family of four was on vacation. Walking through the yard to the front door, I could hear a man yelling, get out of my house, please, politely, but firm and loud. I walked in and found an obviously mentally unstable young man, dirty, bearded, with wild eyes, calmly almost whispering, I was sent, I'm supposed to be here. This is the place, this is the place I was sent here, you'll be sorry. He didn't respond at all to verbal commands, but he didn't resist at all when I put the cuffs on him. It was like he was looking through me 
while I was questioning him, and searched his backpack. I was honestly freaked out, even though I was significantly bigger than him. It was just unsettling. I didn't even want to put the guy in the back of the car. I didn't want to have my back to that tricky guy. His backpack was full of miscellaneous items. A notebook, full of drawn monsters and rambling writings, a hunting knife, clothes that could have been his, mail from different addresses and names, kids' school maths books. It was just weird. Eventually, a county deputy arrived and took him away. I never did hear anything else about it. This reminded me of another time. I was very new and ended up having to babysit a TDO whilst waiting for a mental health services to arrive. It was just he and I in a tiny interrogation room. He was bearded, dirty, erratic, eyes were creepy, and he gave me the creeps. Whenever I would ask him a question like, nice night, huh? He would respond by stopping whatever fidgeting he was doing, look upon the upper corner of a room, and nodding and mumbling, before looking back at me and answering the question. It was like he was getting his orders from an invisible demon hovering in the corner. I was genuinely afraid this nutcase was going to overpower me, take my gun, and go on a killing spree. I was just out of the academy and this guy was clearly capable of violence. The on-call mental health professional that night was a smoking hot young thin girl who immediately sat right beside him and put a sharp pencil in his hand. I was positive that I would be wrestling that pencil from his hand later, but he calmed down when she arrived. Weird. I heard these stories from my dad. He worked for a restoration company, and they had a contract with the city for first responses to certain emergencies. The cops were called to do a welfare check on a woman. The family hadn't heard from her in a week or so. When they got there, they could see her lying on the ground by the front door through the window. They ended up breaking down the back door in order to get in, but she was long gone. So they called the restoration company to come board up the broken back door. My dad arrived on scene before they removed the body. She was all bloated and nasty. My dad had never seen a dead body and was a bit disturbed. The chief of the fire department was there and asked him if he was okay and if it was his first dead body. My dad was like, uh, yeah, and the fire chief didn't seem bothered at all. So my dad asked him what the worst thing was that he'd ever seen. He had three stories, and this in my opinion was the most disturbing. The scene. Apparently, bystanders had seen a guy on his cell phone, and he was clearly arguing with someone. He hung up abruptly, and threw his phone on the ground in anger, and then walked out to the highway. A 16-wheel semi was driving up, and he jumped out in front of it. The driver tried to stop, but every single wheel ran him over. When the fire chief got there, he said there were body parts and little pieces everywhere. The chief thought there was no way someone could survive that. He walked up to the majority of the body and heard noises. Apparently, the guy was still breathing. Then after a moment, he stopped. Immediately, the chief goes in to start performing CPR. As soon as he touched the man's face, his whole head caved in like a rotting pumpkin. About nine years ago, we get a call from a payphone. There's a dead body in the abandoned building at 
corner first and main. An officer responds to the area and can't find anything that would be considered an abandoned building. The caller hangs up without leaving any information and the payphone that he called from was several miles from the area. So the officer clears out the call having no contact. The next day, we get another phone from another payphone. There's a dead body inside the abandoned building at the corner of First and Main. Again, they hung up without offering any other information. This time, I get dispatched the report. I head up to the area of the intersection and start looking around. Now, understand that I live and work in a fairly sizable metropolitan area. And this was when the economy was still good. Booming even. Abandoned buildings were hard to come by at the time. I drive through all the shopping plaza in a little industrial complex within the vicinity of that intersection and I can't come up with anything. So I start driving a little bit further in each direction. But I remember that there's some new construction that hasn't been finished yet. And I wonder if they think that those are considered abandoned. I get out of my car and walk through a bunch of businesses that are still in the framing stages, but I can't find anything. As I leave the area, I'm now more than a mile from the original call location. As I pull out onto the major roadway, I stop for traffic and look in front of me. There it is, a gigantic electrical component factory that has been vacant for probably the last 15 years. It has a nine foot wall around the entire perimeter and the landscaping is still maintained. So it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb right away. That added to the fact that I'm pretty far away from where the caller said it should be. But then again, it's abandoned. It's definitely abandoned and has been for a very long time. So I call for another unit to back me up and we go check it out. We use a drainage pipe to climb in and over the nine foot wall to get inside the perimeter. We start walking the building, checking every single door. When I say this place is big, I mean it's absolutely huge. It's over 100,000 square foot. It's like an old abandoned Motorola or Freescale or Intel type building. It has gigantic coolers on the outside, pipes running all the way down, ductwork running down the sides of the building, loading docks and a basement. Every door we come across is locked and secured. We continue walking around, looking for anything out of place. As I get about three quarters of the way around the building, I pull on a door and it flings open. I call my backup, who comes over to me. We knock, announce and enter the building. As we step into a hallway that leads about a hundred yards down the doors on either side. The door we just stepped into closes and it's black, pitch black, like I can't see my nose on my face black. We start moving through the building, trying to clear each room to the best that two of us can. But this place is absolutely enormous and each room is connected to what seems to be four other rooms. We stepped into one room and the door closes behind us. 
It must have been some old clean room or something. It was the weirdest thing. Because there was no sound. Nothing. I couldn't even hear traffic outside. Or the grumble of electricity. Or air moving. All the sounds that we heard through the rest of the building were gone into this one room. When I spoke to my partner, our voices didn't even echo. It must have been some kind of sound cancelling insulation or something, but it freaked me the hell out. The floor had random 12 inch holes in it that led down to a basement that was flooded by over six feet of water. Wire ceiling panels and wire jacketing were hanging from the ceiling. There was broken glass, broken pieces of metal, and brick holes in the drywall, and abandoned equipment all over. I clearly remember thinking to myself that if there ever would be a time that we were to be attacked, by skinless zombie dogs, this would be it. And the entire time, we are trying to find a dead body. As if this shit wasn't freaky enough, I'm actively looking for a dead guy. We end up moving through the building, clearing it as best we can, until we get to what was definitely the industrial part of the building. Gigantic boilers, evaporative coolers, and components that run the building. Oh, and spiders. A shit ton of spiders. We stepped into a room and find that it's a dead end. We've reached the end of the building and we don't have any further to go. The room is around 20 by 30 meters and contains five very large electrical cabinets. They're about eight feet tall and each about four feet wide, sitting next to each other. And they look exactly how I would design the lab of an evil genius if I had to make a sci-fi movie. The entire thing was covered in dials, levers and red and green buttons. But only the panel in the middle was still illuminated. It had one glowing red light on it. The first and only light I saw in the entire building. My partner calls out to me. You got anything? I replied with no, nothing in here. Looks like this was a gigantic waste of our time. Just let me take a look behind these cabinets and we'll be good to head back to the cars. The panels have around 18 to 24 inches of room on each and between them and the walls and the walls behind them. I walk over to the left side and peek my head round and bam, there he is, a dead guy on the ground, pinned between the wall and the cabinet. He's on his back, arms in front of his chest like a T-Rex and he has some injuries and I nearly shot him. I'm not gonna lie, he scared the living shit out of me, even though I spent the last hour actively looking for him. I still wasn't completely ready for it. So, skip ahead to calling detectives. At the time, stripping copper was fairly new, at least to our area. I didn't recognize what the wire jacketing meant as I hadn't seen it before. These two knuckleheads in breaking into this abandoned factory for God knows how long and systematically stripping every piece of metal out of it. And they made it all the way to the very last room. The only room that still had power running into it. See, the middle panel, you controlled the fire suppression system for the building and the owner's insurance policy required that it remain non-active. When these guys opened up the panels, they must have thought they hit the mother load. Each contained an inch and a half copper cable. Now, an inch and a half copper cable is worth quite a bit of money, 
but it also conducts quite a bit of electricity. They cut through the first one successfully, and leaving the sharp end exposed inside the cabinet. But when this poor sap started cutting into the second one, he got the right of his lifetime. Not only did he electrocute himself, but the current coursing through his arms pulled him into the cabinet, stabbing one of the exposed ends of the previous cable into his chest. This kills the copper thief. What always struck me was that his accomplice never came forward to identify himself. When we contacted the descendants' families, they denied knowing anything about his copper stealing habits. So these two probably stole around $150,000 worth of copper together over several months. And at the end of the day, his buddy left him dead to rot away in an abandoned warehouse. No honor amongst thieves. I answer 911 lines. I had an open line of a guy yelling, ow, in between thud noises. He didn't respond to anything I said. Turns out, those thuds were the sound of him chopping off his fingers with a meat cleaver. I had a good Samaritan call about a guy who pulled up in front of a medical center in his car. He had a travel blender plugged into his vehicle and he was bleeding heavily. He had chopped off his own dick and put it in the blender. I forget the specifics as to why, but it had something to do with a pending child molestation or rape case. Last but not least, the one that will stick with me is the woman who called around eight in the morning on a Sunday, telling me in an eerily calm voice that she had killed her baby by bashing its head into the floor because the devil was inside him. I didn't believe her, but it was true. My father has been an officer for over 20 years, and this story is probably the worst thing he ever had to do. My father and I were heading to the range one day to sight in our hunting rifles. We were in his police vehicle since we were going to the shooting range for local law enforcement personnel. Dispatch came over the radio to get an officer out to a 911 call of a possible dead body. Many of the officers joked over the radio that it was probably a prank or someone overreacting since it was around the time of Halloween. The responding officer arrives at the scene and calls in that he is going into the woods to investigate. A few minutes later, he sends out a call confirming that it is an actual dead body and to get the necessary resources sent out to assist. Then the responding officer personally calls my father because he recognized the body. It was my dad's brother. He had been having rough times and decided to end it all by hanging himself from a tree 50 yards into the wood next to the railroad tracks. The second worst part was that he had been reported missing for a few months. So by the time that they found his body, he was severely rotted. The worst part was that my father had to go to assist in the removal and seen investigation. That was the first day I ever saw my father cry, and I was in my mid-teens. This is a story told to me by a guy I apprenticed for. He was a New Jersey cop in the 80s, and went to a 90-year-old woman's house with his partner on a welfare check. 
no response to knocking on the door. So they circle the property. My apprentice master looks through a back window and saw the little old lady. The glass was rippled and not very clear, but it looked like she was floating. He knocks on that window and the lady doesn't move. He thinks he may have hung herself. They try the nearest door and it opens. They hit the room's lights and see the little old lady in the kitchen, dead. Her lower jaw impaled beneath the chin on a very sharp iron Spanish style cabinet handle. She must have been standing on the counter reaching for something and then slipped. Because the handle was pointed like an arrowhead, they couldn't lift her off the spike. It was the 80s and in Jersey. So they didn't have time to wait for someone to bring cutters for the iron. And they had tough stomachs and no consciences. And after a few minutes of trying to jiggle her jaw off, my apprentice master says screw it and pulls out a combat knife and saws the old lady's jaw off from her face at the hinges, then splits the remaining jaw in half and took it off that way. He laughed telling me that story. No laughs were had from my end. I am a paramedic and I responded to a call for a cardiac arrest. Turns out the guy hadn't paid rent in three months. The landlord got pissed and sent a locksmith round to change the locks. We walked up the stairs to the apartment to be greeted by a locksmith vomiting on the stairs and flies. They were big dumb death flies bouncing off our faces. It was like a low budget scene from the mummy. We enter the apartment and it's really gloomy. The curtains closed, dimly lit, TV on cycling through all the settings by itself. Color contrast, brightness, repeat. I hate this part. Where is he then? I wonder. So we scan the room. Dried old blood on the carpet amongst the beer cans and trash. Chair, sofa, lamp, TV. Where the hell is he? Chair, sofa, lamp. Oh, wait. The lamp was the dude. No head. Sitting in the corner of the room. He was naked. Had his back turned almost skeletal. His neck muscles had rotted and his head had fallen down his back. His pelvis had two large holes either side and they were crawling with maggots and the source of our welcoming party of death flies. We then had to wait 20 minutes before the police showed up and had fun playing spot the dead guy with the rookie cop. I am a 911 dispatcher. I received a call from an elderly lady who had trouble breathing. I had taken several calls from her and her husband in the past. So I recognized her voice. I dispatched an ambulance to her residence and held her on the line, trying to keep her calm while the ambulance was responding. The ambulance advised me that they would be roughly 15 minutes. She lived in a very rural part of West Virginia. I'm talking to her about her husband and how he was doing and just making small talk with her. The ambulance calls in and advises that they are on the scene and I let them know that she is in severe respiratory distress and I still had her on the line. I let her know the ambulance is coming to the door and to go onto the door and she says okay and hangs up the phone. 
pretty normal, right? Well, here is where it gets strange. The EMT and paramedic on scene call about a minute later and advise that no one has answered the door. We have a sheriff unit who was in the area pulling on scene about that time. The sheriff unit confirmed the address and advised he is breaching the door to make access to the property. Five minutes go by and the paramedic on scene radios in asking who the caller was. I advise it was an elderly female who lived at the residence. He tells me that he's going to need to call in and speak with the supervisor on shift. We get him over to the supervisor and the supervisor confirms the information that I gave him and asks what's going on. Apparently, the elderly female had been dead for a while and was already in full rigor mortis. They thought I was wrong on the caller, but the other dispatcher played it back and confirmed it was the female who called. The ambulance transferred the hospital and we got the same cause of disbelief from the doctors. My brother was a police officer for a while. One night, he came over and had dinner with us. He was married and had kids. He was really quiet, and I asked him if everything was okay. Here's what he said. First, he swallowed the food in his mouth took a quick drink and just stared at his plate for a bit. That's when he starts talking. A guy gets ripping drunk at a bar, easily over the limit, almost double, jumps on his motorcycle and screams through town at about 80 miles an hour. He runs a red light and T-bones a pickup truck, flies over the bed of the truck and skids out about 55 feet later. No broken bones, but lots of road rash. He's in the hospital for a couple of days and then is sent off to jail. Another motorcycle accident, an older couple on a Goldwing, all safety gear obeying the law the whole time. A Toyota Tacoma hits them at about 35 miles an hour. He breaks his neck on the curb and is dead on the spot. She gets pinned under the bike, leg broken and knee wasted. Probably have to amputate. I was on both calls about two hours apart. Sometimes you just gotta wonder. And then he went back to eating dinner. I got a call for a missing child. I got to the home to find the mother highly distressed and not sure what to do. I called in everyone to first search the home and property. I decided to search the backyard since it was a large wooded lot with no visible fence. After around 10 minutes, I found the boy. He was caught on an old chain link fence in the woods that was blocked by a bunch of trees. So you couldn't see him from the house. He had basically gotten strangled to death on a fence. He must have been climbing, fell on it, and got his hooded sweatshirt caught. The worst part for me was having to call it on the radio, knowing the mother might hear it from the inside from one of the other officers. My dad used to work in a precinct with one of the highest crime rates in New York City. I think it had the highest murder rate during his years on the job. Anyway, he won't tell us stories about what he's seen because they're mostly horrific and still give him nightmares almost 15 years off the job. However, I do remember he told us one story when he was really drunk. 
A woman in her twenties walked into her apartment building late from work one night and was waiting for her elevator. It opened, and the only person in there was a creepy looking guy. Though apprehensive, she got in and pressed her floor number, but noticed that the basement button was pressed. Normally, after 9 pm, maintenance would lock the basement button to prevent random people from going down there and messing shit up. I guess someone forgot to lock it. The creepy guy ended up taking her down there, tying her up, raping, and torturing her for hours. He then took her apartment key, went up to the floor that she'd pressed when she'd first gotten into the elevator, tried every door until he found hers, and took her roommate, who was also a woman in her twenties, into the basement, where he continued torturing and raping both women until dawn. Maintenance found them that morning, and my dad was a responder. Again, my dad never told us stories. This one might have stuck out, because he has four daughters. But I think it's got to be up there in the creepy factor. I work for the police force. This is one of the eeriest calls that I've ever been asked to do. We have this older gentleman who lives alone. He's a frequent caller about hearing someone upstairs. I'd never been called to do this particular one before, but other people had, and they told me to be wary on my first time, that it was a creepy place, and to let them know if I saw anything. At first, I wasn't really sure what they meant, but I went to do the call anyway. The house was basically a time capsule. The gentleman insisted that someone was upstairs and that he was using the air conditioning ducts to get from the top floor to the first floor. The house was split like a duplex and the only way to get upstairs was from an outside entrance. So my partner and I went up to the second floor to clear it. We were not disappointed. It was a very eerie setup. A record player with a chair set up in the front and headphones still plugged in laying on the chair. Very old appliances in the kitchen, as well as old electronics all in great condition, as well as a stack of adult magazines, all from way back in the day, spread out in the living room area. Everything undisturbed with a layer of dust on it for God knows how long. We didn't find anyone up there, but the atmosphere was particularly creepy. He called back a few more times saying that someone was messing with him upstairs. We always make the rookies go, as an almost initiation of sorts, to see if anything creepy will befall them on their first visit. We had a call of a suspicious vehicle sitting in front of a drug house, where we had a quadruple homicide the year before. An officer went out to check and the vehicle took off. Our policy prevented the officer from pursuing the vehicle. Soon after, the suspect shot at another officer, ditched the vehicle, and broke into a nearby house through the back door to hide. The homeowner, an elderly man, tried to call 911, but was unable to say much before the suspect attacked him. We surrounded the house, but the supervisors wouldn't let us go in under exigent circumstances because they were afraid of liability, as we didn't know for sure if he was in the house. 
and a judge refused to sign the search warrant. A family member came by later and called when he found the door barricaded and couldn't get inside. He gave us a key and I was one of the first ones in. There was blood covering the floors and all over the walls. There were two bodies, wrapped in bloody sheets in the hallway. The suspect had to still be in the house, and possibly still armed. We pulled the sheets back, and there was the homeowner. The suspect had beaten his face with an iron until it caved into his skull. Then he stabbed him numerous times in the face and neck with a steak knife. His face was completely mangled. The other body, right next to the victim, was the suspect. He was pretending to be dead. We drag him out so hard that his clothes rip off. He woke up and began telling us a lie about being attacked by a group of guys. He later admitted to shooting at the officer and murdering the old man. The worst part was when he said that the old man took a while to die. He was still breathing when we had the house surrounded and the supervisors and judges wouldn't let us go in the house. I am a small town cop. One time we had an elderly woman with dementia call at about 3am and say that there was a baby hanging in her grandfather clock. I got there and it was a pretty big house and she had a single light on in the living room, making it all the more creepy. When she points out the clock, it's quite obvious she is hallucinating. But just imagining what she was seeing gives me the creeps. Ever since starting this job, I have extreme sympathy for those with dementia or schizophrenia. I never knew what they went through before I started working as a cop. Them seeing or hearing people in their house in the middle of the night. I couldn't imagine. We also had a guy in a plow truck get hit by a train during a snowstorm. Obviously, fatal accidents happen every day, but the call came in as the train hitting a plow truck, no injuries. So when I show up, I start calmly walking up the tracks, thinking the train just clipped the truck, or the driver got up before the truck got it, and it would be a routine accident. Nope. I get to the tracks, see a mangled plow truck, in a small pond next to the tracks and a yellow jacket floating with two boots sticking out the water. The driver got ejected when the train, doing 65 miles an hour, hit the truck and died instantly. I had to compose myself and call out what I was seeing on the radio. Finally, I'll never forget my first unresponsive person call. I was 23 years old and a week out of the academy, still obviously riding with my training officer. We got to the house before the medics, and it was a 30-year-old male. He was completely naked in bed, with three fans blowing on him. My training officer gave him a little sternum rub, and he opened his eyes and started moaning. Being the new guy, I get sent downstairs to talk to his mum about any medical conditions he has or had, and medications he was taking. The medics get there, and I start bringing him down the stairs. He's white as a ghost, his eyes are wide open, and his mouth is hanging open. I hear my training officer say that he doesn't look good, and one of the medics answers, he's not, he just coded. Not breathing, no pulse. Creepy thing is, as they were bringing him down the stairs, he was looking right at me. First time I've ever seen the emptiness that comes with someone who is technically dead. Happy ending though. Medics brought him back whilst en route to the hospital. 
bonus story. My roommate at the time was a volunteer EMT. He woke me up one Tuesday morning, holding a bottle of scotch and saying that he needed help. He told me this story as we polished off the bottle. They get a call that all available units, police, fire, ambulance, first responders, everyone needs to show up at this house. Dispatch tries to explain, but just said everyone is screaming and I can't understand what's happening. By the time he gets there, two police officers and a first responder are in the yard vomiting. His group runs inside to find the first ambulance crew shaking and crying. Now, his crew gets completely concerned, but runs into the bedroom. What he happened to see was something out of a horror film. Blood on the ceiling, on the walls, on the floor, everywhere. And especially over a naked male and naked female. They are both screaming and no one can understand where the blood came from. They check the male, he has no wounds. So they escort him out and they begin to check on the woman. In between her legs is a constant stream of blood and it looks like her vagina had been chewed up by a power tool. And that's when they saw it, literally. This couple decided to make their own sex machine out of a reciprocating saw. But they decided to slide the dildo onto an actual saw blade. When they turned up the speed, well, guess what happened? Miraculously, she survived. But I'm sure with major irreversible damage. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's stories. I always find them particularly chilling. Just a reminder that Creaks and Peaks and myself are currently hosting a competition to win some amazing original artwork. We have one day left as a winner will be announced in tomorrow's video. So hurry whilst you can. You can find a link in the description if you'd like a chance to win. If you enjoyed today's video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and consider subscribing for even more stories every day. I also want to give a big happy birthday to my brother Ollie, or as you may know him, History Profiles. Feel free to click on his channel or latest video, which you'll find in the description or on screen at the end, to wish him a happy birthday as well. Don't forget that if you would like me to read your story on my channel, feel free to send it to my email or share it to my Reddit, which is of course in the description. Just please make sure to include as much punctuation and details as possible to maximize the chances of it being read. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome and I'll see you in the next one.